All right, uh, jumping right back into the actual war itself. Um, the Spanish-American War is one of the quickest wars that the United States is really ever going to get involved in. Um, and it's, I mean, for, for our purposes here, we're really going to remember it as uh, the, the big claim to fame for U.S. imperialism, number one, meaning that it's going to be one of the ways that the United States sort of makes a name for itself in terms of uh, becoming a world power, you know, recognizable to a lot of countries uh, in other parts of the world. And the other uh, big benefit of the Spanish-American War for the United States comes from Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, this is going to be Theodore Roosevelt's big claim to fame, um, uh, particularly being a rough rider and being um, somebody who fights and, and uh, wins the Battle of San Juan Hill. Um, at the time, Teddy Roosevelt is Secretary of the Navy, um, to William McKinley, all right? He is not yet, um, McKinley's vice president, rather. He is, uh, the secretary of the Navy. So even though he's a secretary of the Navy, he's somebody who's working with McKinley in the White House. Um, he actually takes his position and he resigns to go and fight in the Spanish-American War. Um, this is where Roosevelt becomes super popular to uh, the United States as a whole. Um, he leads this group known as the Rough Riders, uh, who are going to be um, cavalry in the Spanish-American War. And if you don't know what cavalry is, uh, okay. cavalry, they are the guys who uh, basically ride in on horses and they do all of their fighting on horseback. Um, we've talked about Teddy Roosevelt before. He's a guy who... Um, knows how to ride a horse from a pretty young age. He's a big sportsman. Um, so he's going to come in as this uh, expert horseman, this expert, I, I don't want to throw the term athlete around, but he's a guy who's in great shape, who, who's going to come in. Um, he, he's a soldier. Like he, he, knows, um, he knows how to fight. He knows how to ride on horseback. And he is absolutely excellent. Um, He's actually not supposed to be the guy who leads the Rough Riders. There's another guy named uh, Leonard Wood who uh, basically is chosen to be the leader of the Rough Riders. And when they find out that um, Teddy Roosevelt is involved at all, basically all of the guys sort of rally behind Teddy Roosevelt. And Leonard Wood basically looks at Teddy and is like, dude, you got you to gotta do this. You got to lead these guys. And he really didn't want any part of it. But um, but he does. Um, the, the big name... For, for us, anyway, the big name uh, in terms of battles uh, at um, w within Cuba in the Spanish-American War is uh, the Battle of San Juan Hill. Um, basically, it's a two-day battle um, between uh, the United States and Spain. Um, we utilize uh, the cavalry. We utilize the Rough Riders and Teddy Roosevelt. Um, within the two days uh, after this, this, this is sort of like the peak for um, U.S. involvement in the Spanish-American War because after this, uh, the Spanish Navy, we completely just obliterate them, uh, take them out of commission in terms of their ability to continue in the war here. Uh, again, the, the big name here is Teddy Roosevelt. He, he goes into this war, the Secretary of the Navy, he resigns, he then leaves to fight in the war, comes back as this big name war hero. Uh, it's going to really skyrocket him to popularity so that when he does come back, he wants to jump back into politics, he's going to become... Um, in the in the upcoming presidential election, um, he is going to be the guy who runs with William McKinley. Okay, um, there you see uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, this this portrait, I guess rather, of uh, Roosevelt on horseback, sort of leading the Rough Riders to this victory in Cuba. Guys, just look at him. Again, everybody thinks that they are cool. Nobody will ever be Teddy Roosevelt cool. Guys, just look at him. Holy moly. This is them at the top of San Juan Hill with the flag, obviously capturing um, San Juan Hill after the battle. Uh, we've actually talked about this guy before. We've talked about John Hay before. He is the Secretary of State. Uh, he is the guy who went and tries to basically elbow the United States into China. Um, when we were talking about the open door policy trading in China, John Hay is the guy who 
wants to go in and basically um, sort of finagle a way for the United States to get in and, and um, trade in China. He is a guy who uh, very famously calls the Spanish-American War a splendid little war, uh, which is pretty funny given that he actually didn't go fight in the war at all, but what he means by that is it only lasted four months, and relatively a pretty small amount of our uh, U.S. troops get killed in battle. But what John Hay maybe doesn't know, or maybe he does know and just uh, sort of fails to talk about, is the fact that even though we only lost 4,600 people uh, because of them being killed in battle, we lose more than that. We lose 5,000 plus uh, in terms of them dying from diseases, things like yellow fever, things like malaria um, in a place like Cuba. Uh, what we need to know post-Spanish-American War is that Cuba becomes what's known as a protectorate of the United States. So how is that different from being a state or how is that different from being a territory? Um, Cuba becomes a protectorate, meaning that they're going to have their independence, however, they're not going to have 100% of their independence. And you're probably sitting there like, dude, what does that mean? How, how do they have their independence but not really? What this means, and, and this is important here to note, that the Platt Amendment, there's an amendment that is created in Congress once the Spanish-American War is over. And basically what this means for Cuba to become a protectorate, it means that they're they're going to technically be independent, meaning that they can fly their Cuban flag they can do whatever they want, they can elect their own leaders, they can make their own rules, they can do everything that a country does. However, they are going to be under the protection, and I'm going to use some air quotes that you can't see around the word protection, they're going to have some protection by the U.S. military and the U.S. government, meaning that they can do what they want, they can fly their own flag, do their thing, however, the United States is going to be involved in their affairs. And and basically, you know, did they get their independence from Spain? Yes. Did they get total 100% absolutely free independence? Not really, because the United States basically comes in and says, well, even though you're independent from Spain now, we sort of reserve the right to come in and take any territory that we want on the island. And eventually that territory that we're going to take is going to be... Um, a harbor um, known as Guantanamo Bay. We're basically going to, and, and I even put actual quotes around the word lease, uh, we're going to lease Guantanamo Bay, meaning that we're going to kind of rent it from them um, beginning in 1903 because of that Platt Amendment. Uh, you've probably heard about Guantanamo Bay in your lifetime as being a place where we've taken um, basically prisoners of war and like potential terrorists um, and, and, and suspected terrorists. Uh, that the United States has taken to Guantanamo Bay. And um, at this time, we're going to use it as a place to do some trading. Um, since then, th th there's been sort of a, a strange story with Guantanamo Bay. Uh, since 1959, um, and this actually changed a couple of years ago, but uh, Cuba and the United States did not really have positive uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, this is actually... Um, this changes after uh, President Obama sort of lifts this, um, the, basically this temporary ban between us and Cuba um, that, that does not let us go uh, to Cuba or allow Cubans to come to the United States. This changes, but then uh, again, under the Trump administration has been changed again. Um, uh, throughout all of the craziness, though, we have still had uh, control over a base at Guantanamo Bay. Yeah, you can see Guantanamo there. If you uh, look at Cuba, it's just chilling there on the coast, the little harbor down there. So, one more thing. Um, the Philippines, which is not anywhere near Cuba, but this is actually in the Pacific Ocean, way, way, way far away from Cuba. Here's one thing I want you to think about. Cuba was a colony of Spain. We talked about that. The Philippines are also a colony of Spain. So the Philippines 
and, and everything that's happening in the Philippines, they sort of see what's happening with how the United States is taking care and taking interest in Cuba, and they're thinking that they're going to get the same treatment in the Philippines because they're also a Spanish colony. So this guy on the right here with a mustache, his name's Commodore George Dewey. Um, he basically launches this surprise attack in the Philippines um, at specifically Manila Bay. I'm, I'm probably not going to ask you about it later, but maybe I will. Um, just remember Commodore George Dewey launching an attack at Manila Bay here. Um, and he's going to uh, be the big name that sort of helps defeat the Spanish Navy in the Philippines. What's important here about the Philippines is that after the war is finished there, they think that they're going to get the same treatment that Cuba does. They're going to think that they're going to have this, you know, big old air quotes, technical independence. Uh, they're not really going to get that. Um, they think that we're going to support their quest uh, for independence, just like we did with Cuba. Not exactly uh, how it's going to work. This guy, Emilio Aguinaldo, uh, he is a Filipino who leads a revolution, uh, basically looking for independence for the Philippines, just like the Cubans were trying to do. They were trying to get their independence. Um, however, the Filipinos, they turn around after we help them gain their independence from Spain, and they say, hey, great, we're going to be independent. And we go, uh, not really. And, and we basically maintain the Philippines as a United States territory until 1946. So, why does this matter? Who cares? Why are we learning about this stuff? Well, basically, the Spanish-American War is going to be this, this door through which the United States is going to be on one side of the door, this kind of, I don't want to use the word timid, but basically not quite as outwardly spoken about our foreign policy. We go through the door that is the Spanish-American War, and we come out defeating the Spanish Empire, which doesn't sound all that crazy impressive, but it is pretty crazy impressive. So the Spanish Empire at this point has been really dented, really screwed up because of the United States. We add the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Guam, and technically Cuba as territories to the United States, which makes us look like a world power. So what this means for us is we kind of come out the other side with a whole lot of respect that we've earned from other parts of the world. All right. Um, so at this point, this should complete the note guide that you guys have for the Spanish American War. Um, keep an eye out throughout this, this upcoming week, because we're going to have a, a couple assignments that specifically talk about the Spanish American War. Um, specifically talking about Cuba, specifically talking about the Philippines, um, and basically what this means. Um, and, and I want you to really think about this piece a little bit more than the rest of them, because the fact that we're going to become a world power is huge. Um, this is basically like the transition, the coming of age moment for the United States uh, in terms of respect from the rest of the world. All right. So that's all I got for you guys. Um, Thank you guys again for watching. Thanks for following along with the note guide. If you guys have any questions about any assignments, please hit me up uh, through Google Classroom or shoot me an email. Um, again, I hope you guys are doing well. I hope everybody's staying home, staying safe. Hope everybody's families are doing great. Um, and just stay tuned in Google Classroom. And uh, I'll see you guys soon.